Help me out, woman. Oh Lord, I don't know wrong. It's just the sheer musicianship that uh, draws people in. Um, there's so much to discover as well because his career went through so many twists and turns with the jazz rock sort of stuff with Coliseum 2, the hard rock stuff he was doing and then the blues stuff. Um, but it was all kind of Gary at the end of the day, it was all guitar playing. He went through a change of style, a radical change of style, which yeah. is a, an incredible risk for any artist to, mm. to be a, a kind of a spandex-clad, pointy headstock rock god yeah. one minute, and then go over and say, no, I want to play the blues, yeah. and this is how I'm going to do it, yeah. and still win. I first started working for Gary back in 1988 as a guitar technician, and got... Uh, uh, further up the ladder, if you, if you want to call it, uh, ended up being, uh, as I was called the other day in the, in the music press, uh, director of operations, um, very much involved in the compilation of the box set in conjunction with BMG, putting together the tracks and sequencing order and digging out uh, the live album, getting that sorted out for the, uh, for the release. The whole box set thing has got, um, has got studio blues from Gary, has got live live recordings from Gary Moore in his blues period um, and I'm very pleased to say that accompanying the whole ensemble uh, is my official biography of Gary called uh, I Can't Wait Until Tomorrow. My team and I were challenged with the project of uh, the Gary Moore Blues and Beyond uh, campaign. So we designed the box set, the 4LP, the digipack, the whole concept together from, from beginning to end really. You get the audio and you get the kind of the whole backstory that goes goes with it. That's why you love me. Love me He poured himself and a whole ton of emotion into virtually everything he played. Yeah. And yeah. that comes across. An audience will feel that. And yeah. I think he, he was able to reach out to so many people. You have to really get inside them and figure out, okay, what were they about? Um, what was their style, mannerisms, uh, dress sense, you know, everything. So in order for me to do that, I had to watch hours and hours of live footage, um, go through his archives, archive of photography, you know, literally figure out, okay, what was his haircuts like? Did he sweat on stage? Um, uh, yeah, ev everything, literally everything. You have to live, breathe and eat and sleep Gary Moore. And until you do that and understand him, why he did, why he did what he did and everything, only then you can start to think of a concept or how you can actually bring him to life in this artwork. He had this amazing technical facility. You know, he could play the, the, you know, the million notes a second uh, kind of thing, but uh, on volume 11, but he could pull back. You see him do it live on stage every time. He'd knock back the volume on the guitar, play tiny notes really quietly and sensitively, and he had that ability to, I mean, probably only Jimi Hendrix had it in a similar amount, to go from this whisper to a roar, it, it, you know, in the, in the space of a bar of music. And I don't think anybody else has had that ability. I was just asking somebody downstairs, who are the new guitar heroes? Whereas Gary is very much in that guitar hero camp. Um, there's lots of great guitar players around at the moment in bands, but there's no real standout guys, I, I think, I feel. Um, and Gary was definitely in that guitar hero camp. Well, he did everything he did, he did with aplomb because he had the technical chops to play the rock stuff. But he has, as I say, the, the feeling and, and, and the emotion to bring it back down to sweet notes and play like Peter Green in the blues. And, and he played like, he, I mean, the great other thing about Gary was he wore his influences on his sleeve quite happily. I remember him saying to me once, he said, sometimes you have to start a blues solo with Albert King licks. There's no other lick that, that will work. 
And I know exactly what he means by that. And he could call upon those influences at will, not in a copying way, but in a reverential tip of the hat. It was a joy from beginning to end, especially in the beginning when you're really getting to know him. Um, and then you're, st you're kind of almost, when you're designing, you're, you're kind of growing with him. And the more you listen to him, the more you realize, okay, well, actually I can change this and stay more true to him. Garrick had people guessing, which I think at this day, yeah, it's good. Yeah.